Let's pray together. God, we thank you for the opportunity as always to gather, not just at one place or even one gathering, God, but multiple gatherings, multiple campuses. And God, we thank you for what you're doing here in the life of our church. And we know, God, as we say all the time, it's not our church, it's your church. These are your people. And so God, thank you that you are working in our midst. And we ask you to do the same again today to speak to us as we're going to talk about God we want to submit ourselves to you to your authority in our life and God I know there are people here maybe that have never never taken that first step of submitting themselves to you God I pray by your spirit today you would help them to trust you be saved and then go those of us God who claim you as our father like we said last week God, I pray that you would help us by your spirit as well to continue to submit to you, to bring our lives underneath your authority. And we do that primarily, God, by submitting to the authority of your word in our life. And that's what we want to do now. As we open your word, God, we ask that you would speak to us. We pray and ask your spirit to help us to see and to understand and then to live in light of these truths. And as always, God, help me to communicate it in a way that honors you and is helpful to us. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen, amen, all right? If you got a Bible, open it up to Ephesians chapter five. I hope you're doing well. If you're doing good, you look good, all right? Uh, well, at least most of you, most of you look good. Um, no, I'm just kidding, I'm just kidding. You all look good. Ephesians chapter five, we're gonna pick right up where we left off last week. We're gonna be in verses 15 through 21. And again, continue the same thought. That's why we put the verses on the screen for you to read to kind of get your mind around what we talked about last week. And if you weren't here, as always, you can go back and watch that message. But we're going to pick up in this same flow of thought as we've been talking about living in light of now the gospel and how we walk. Last week, we talked about walking as children of light because we have the father of light and now we want to submit our lives to him and live in a way that he tells us. And so again, we're going to pick up with that same idea today in verse 15 uh, through 18 is where we're going to start, but we'll work our way all the way down to verse 21. So let's read that first and then we'll chat about it. Paul says, look carefully then how you walk, not as unwise, but as wise, making the best use of the time because the days are evil. Therefore, do not be foolish, but understand what the will of the Lord is. And do not get drunk with wine, for that is debauchery, but be filled with the Spirit. So first he says, look carefully then. So he says, look carefully then. Another way of saying then is therefore, he's referring back to what he said, He says, walk as children of light. That's what we talked about last week. And how do we walk as children of light? Now he's gonna help qualify that for us. But first you have to understand, he says, look carefully then. And this is a command, by the way. To look carefully means to examine it, to to think about it, to not be passive. I think one of the biggest things that we have to understand as as a Christian is if you're going to walk correctly, You can't coast. You can't just kind of like, you know what? I think I've pretty much arrived. Like, I am great. I mean, I am doing fantastic. And anybody knows anything that if you're not growing, you are dying, right? There's no neutral. And even if there was neutral, think about it. Whatever's in neutral can be pushed, can be manipulated. And so this is a command to say, hey, you have to continue to examine, to to look carefully at yourself. And I love how he says here, look carefully then how you walk. How is an adverb of manner. It's, It's the way in which you walk. So not only are we given the command to walk in such a way, uh, walk in such a way, we are giving the command to continue to look at how we're walking. And this word here, how, is important to understand. I like to think about it. In fact, we just had a staff gathering last week, and we brought in a magician. And anytime you see a magician or illusionist, you know, like do a trick, your first response is, how? How did that happen? Right? And thankfully, we know it's not witchcraft, right? 
Because some of us are like, I ain't into witchcraft, man. Like, it's not that. It, obviously, it's either sleight of hand or a skill or, you know, out of practice, all that kind of stuff. And they do, like, again, even our staff, I mean, there was things that, that the magician did. We're like, how did you do that? And so this whole idea of how is you're trying to figure something out. And, and even thinking about that, you have to look carefully, right? You have to pay attention. You, you, you can't just kind of sit back and relax, so, so thinking about that from the perspective of, like, okay, I'm trying to have, figure out how you did this, you have to take that same vigor, like if you're trying to figure out what's happening in a magic trick and think, okay, I'm going to take that same passion of trying to figure out how that happened or how did this happen, and I'm going to apply it to myself. And this is what I think is so important. It is so important to understand that you have to take time to reflect back on yourself and think, how did I do? Like, this is a great exercise, a great spiritual discipline at the end of the day to think about, you know what? How did I walk today? How did I do that? How did I do today? How did I love today? How did I live today? How did I walk today? How, and was I wise? Was I unwise? Was I foolish? Was I understanding, right? You got to take some time. And one of the great spiritual disciplines, and I've talked to our staff about this as well, is called the, the prayer of examine. And the prayer of examine is a great spiritual discipline that's been around for hundreds of years that actually walks you through. You can just Google it if you don't know what I'm talking about or, or look it up if you don't like Google, all right? You can just search it, all right? Um, but it's a great kind of methodical process. And it really just kind of walks you through four or five steps that really helps you take a moment to pray, invite the power of the Spirit, and then you just look at your life. And you think, you know what? I need to think about, I need to look carefully at how I walked today. I need to look carefully, like, how did I do? How did I interact with people that I work with? How did I respond in traffic, right? How, how did I do? Because here's what I know. You can't grow by coasting. You can't grow by being passive. You grow by being active, by processing, by thinking. Here's another one. Ask some other people how you're doing. Hey, man, how, how did I walk today? Because I want to be aware of how I'm doing. I, I want to ask you to help me. I want you to look carefully at how I'm walking. So the first thing that you have to understand here is you have to be willing to accept the truth about yourself. You have to be willing to take a hard look at yourself. This is one of the reasons why I listen back and I watch back my messages all the time. Because I know why I did certain things or I have forgot to do that or, or I can look at myself and like, quit doing that annoying thing. I won't tell you what those are because then you'll tell me to quit doing those things, all right? But I know what they are, right? I, I know how I do things and sometimes it's unconscious. I'm not thinking about it and it's not until I watch it back, right, that I realize, yeah, so I, that I say, watch this, right? I'm like, sometimes, oh, you know, it's frustrating. Quit saying that. But I wouldn't get that insight if I didn't take a moment to look carefully, to examine it. And here's what I think a lot of us won't look carefully because we're afraid of what we'll find. We're afraid of like, I don't want to examine that, man. I don't want to look at that. I would just rather shove all that stuff in the closet and act like it's not there. Well, that might help you sell a house, but it ain't helping you in your holiness, right? So if you want to be holy as God is holy, again, you need to look carefully, you need to take an active role. You need to be careful, deliberate. I love this. It means implying care and adequateness. We don't take a passiveness to our life. Now, there's a couple things. In fact, we're going to look at this verse two different times, and I'm going to highlight two different parts in this verse. The first thing that I want to highlight is in this set of scriptures, there's three negative and positive pairs. And what that I mean by that is there's 
three negative things that you're not supposed to do, and three positive things that you're supposed to do. And they correlate with one another. But I want to show you the three negative things together, and then I want to show you the three positive things together. So first, here's the first negative positive pair. Let me show you the negatives, all right? Unwise, foolish, drunk. Those are the negatives, all right? And unwise pairs with wise, foolish pairs with understanding. And, and this is interesting, we'll get into it in a second. Drunk compares with being filled with the Spirit, which you might find that an odd comparison, but I think it's pretty awesome and hilarious at the same time. But here's the negatives, and here's why I want to put these together for you to see. You may not see it unless you kind of think about it this way, but they actually work together. And here's, the, here's what I want you to see. If you're drunk, you'll be foolish and unwise, right? If you're drunk, and what is being drunk? You're like, I don't know, Pastor. I have never experienced that before. I mean, I have seen people on TV. But personally, your boy has never, don't lie, all right? But maybe you haven't, maybe you haven't, all right? But what is being drunk? We define that as being under the influence, right? Being under the influence of alcohol. That's what this text means, right? Don't be drunk, And he actually tells us, with wine. And I want you to hear me say this, all right? And depending upon your church background, you may cheer me or you may curse me, all right? It is not a sin to drink. It is not a sin to drink wine. It is not a sin to drink alcohol. Jesus' very first miracle, he turned water into wine, And people like to explain that away and say, well, it wasn't actually alcohol. It didn't have time to ferment. As if Jesus needed time for it to ferment. Right? That's like saying, well, the dude didn't have time for his bones to heal. Well, how did he get up and walk? How did the dude at the party say, this is the best wine I ever drank? Clearly, it was alcoholic. All right? So, That's not the point, though. And I think a lot of times we get hung up there. Now, listen to me. If your spiritual conviction is not to drink, no problem. No problem. I know people who don't drink because their reasoning is Jesus said at the Last Supper, until I see you again, I won't take of this drink again. And they use that as justification. If Jesus is not drinking, I'm not. Jesus refused on the cross. No problem. I get that. But we can't take something that the Lord has convicted you of and then make it a command if the Bible didn't. So again, not the whole point of the sermon. Please don't leave here today thinking, what was the sermon about? It was about alcohol. No. The point of the sermon is about influence about being under the influence. That's why it's compared to the spirit. So let's look at the positives, all right? So we look at the negatives. Let's look at the positives. The positive pair to the negatives is unwise is wise. So wise, understand what the Lord's will is, and filled with the spirit. Now, here's the key I want you to see and why I put them like this. If you're filled with the Spirit, you'll understand what the will of the Lord is, and therefore you'll walk wisely. You see how they work together? So if I'm under the influence, and by the way, alcohol is not the only thing you can be under the influence of. You can be under the influence of evil. And you'll see that in the verse in just a second as well. I'll point that out. But it is something that Paul was using as an explanation to say, hey, if you're unwise, if you're foolish, it's because you're under the wrong influence. But if you're wise and you understand what the will of the Lord is, it's because you're under the influence of the Spirit. So how do I know if I'm under the influence of the Spirit? Because I will understand what the Lord's will is and therefore I will 
live or walk wisely. So I say this to you all the time. The world is binary, right? It's dark or light, truth or lies, father of light, father of lies, wise and unwise, foolish, understanding, under the influence of alcohol, drunk, other things, under the influence of the Holy Spirit. So that's the connection that Paul wants you to see here. This is why he says, look carefully at how you're walking. And then he gives three pairs. You're either walking wise or unwise. And if you're walking unwise, it's because you're foolish. So don't be foolish. Well, how do I not be foolish? I'm under the right influence. Or you're walking wise, and if you're walking wise, then you under, it's because you have some understanding. And how did you get some understanding? Because you ain't drunk no more. Right? Like you're under the power, you're under the influence of a different spirit. That's the key. And this is what, I, again, I find interesting and also amazing and a little hilarious. If you want to know what it means to be filled with the Spirit, the example is drunk people. Like, Paul makes that comparison. What does it mean to be under the influence of alcohol? It means something else is, is acting on, I'm acting under the influence of something and it's changing how I speak which sometimes like slurs your speech. And we'll get into this more in just a second. Some people, when they get drunk, they're either a mean drunk or a nice drunk. They get real mean or they get real nice, right? They start taking everybody out with their words or they start telling everybody they love them, right? Because it's kind of giving them in their mind, it's kind of releasing maybe some inhibitions that they have or some fears that they have, like feel real loose and relaxed, right? I, this is a perfect metaphor, by the way. And not only does it change their speech, but it changes their actions, right? I can't tell you how many times, again, I grew up with an alcoholic father. I have alcoholic family members. By God's grace, my father's not anymore. I've seen some dumb stuff. I can't tell you how many times as a kid in a red Solo cup, I drank what I thought was Coke, but it was more Jack than Coke. And to this day, I am not, to this day, like just the smell of Jack Daniels, it's that, that I don't like that, I don't enjoy it. The most beers I don't like and I don't enjoy because they just bring me back to my childhood. I can't tell you how many times I was like, this is the most disgusting Coke I've ever tasted in my life. And I used to upset my father all the time. I don't know where I got the courage to do this, but he'd ask me to go get him a drink. I'd shake it up real, real hard, and I'd go hand it to him. I'd sit back and watch. And he'd have that, right? Where are you? And I'd take off running, right? But there were, I mean, I would be my father's and my father's friend's bartender at like five. We would go on hunting trips, and I would sit in the back, and they were like, give me a beer, right? That was my upbringing. So I have seen a lot of drunk people. And I have seen a lot of drunk people say some stupid stuff and do some stupid stuff. This is why most rednecks will say one horrible line before something stupid happens. Watch this, hold my beer. Right? They use watch this a little differently than I do in a sermon. But here's what I want you to see. The influence of the alcohol changes them. Changes how they speak, changes how they act. Do you see why now this is a great analogy? Because the influence of the spirit should change how you speak and should change how you talk in the same way that alcohol does. I mean, not in the same way. It leads to different outcomes. But in a similar way, you live underneath the influence of the Spirit, then you're going to have these positive things. You're going to have understanding. You're not going to be foolish. 
You're going to walk wisely, not unwise. So that is what Paul's getting at here. In fact, this phrase here, be filled with the Spirit, is, and I'll show you this in just a second, is really kind of like the pivotal command to this whole section of Scripture. And what I mean by that, you go forward up to verse 15, and then you go backwards or further down to verse 21, and it's the influence of the Spirit right in the middle of this text that brings about these results. So the influence of the Holy Spirit is a very important influence. In fact, it's a command by God, be filled with the Spirit. And I've said this many times, depending again on your church background, I think a lot of people, you might actually be afraid of that because the only context you have for being filled with the Spirit is people talking like they're drunk. Like they're talking in other languages, speaking in tongues. And we are not a church that believes those gifts stopped. But I want you to see, that's not the only fruit. And I've said this many times. It's not the only result. In fact, that's a spiritual gift. That is one result of the influence of the Spirit. And I'm cool with that. But I think we actually do a disservice if we think that's the only one, so therefore, I need to stay away from the Spirit. Because if I get up in the Spirit, man, I'm gonna start acting like a drunk folk. I'm gonna start flailing around and saying weird stuff. That's how a lot of people, sadly, think about the Spirit. And this has been a journey, again, in my own life, and it's been so helpful. In fact, every time before I come out here to speak, I pray a very similar prayer, and it goes something like this, God, fill me with your spirit. Now, I fully believe when you trust Christ, and you'll see this at the end, you are, you are baptized in the spirit. But I want you to see this. The Holy Spirit lives in me, and if you trust Christ, the Holy Spirit lives in you, but just because he's in you doesn't mean you're being filled by him, right? He's in you, and so I'm not asking for the Holy Spirit to come on me like it happened when I was saved. The Holy Spirit is in me, but what I'm doing is saying, Father, please allow the Holy Spirit who lives in me to have more influence on me than my flesh does. Please allow the Holy Spirit, please fill my whole body, my mind, my heart with the Spirit. Fill me. And and what I'm asking is, Father, I want to be under the influence and power of the Spirit. Because in the same way, in the same way that alcohol affects you when you're filled with it, changes your speech, changes your actions, you need to be filled with something, with a, not a substance in that sense, but a person who will change your speech and your actions. So here's what I want you to see. You can't change your your, uh, actions and your speech without the influence of the Spirit. So if these things need to be changed, and they do, by the way, And you'll notice that if you look carefully. It will only happen as you continue to bring yourself underneath the influence of the Spirit. Does that make sense? So this is what I want you to see. This is how we do it. Now, let's go back to the same set of verses, verse 15 and 18, and I've highlighted different parts, all right? So we've talked about the the negative and positive pairs in the role of the Holy Spirit, but I want you to see something else here. Look carefully then how you walk, right? That's the main command. Not as unwise, but as wise. Now, here's the part that I want you to see. Verse 16, making the best use of the time. Making the best use of the time. Why? Because the days are evil. Because the days are evil. Then, therefore, do not be foolish, but understand what the will of the Lord is. Do not get drunk with wine, for that is debauchery, but be filled with the Spirit. So we've already talked about that, those negative and positive pairings, but now I wanna highlight 
this part right in the middle. And there's something I want you to see because it's really cool. When he says, make the best use of the time, this word here, and it's not a bad translation, it does mean this, but it really means redeem the time. Or better yet, think about it like this, purchase the time. Purchase the time. But the word here, time, is not time and how we think about it just in like linear it's two o'clock, it's three o'clock. There's two main words in the Greek for time. One is chronos, that means like how we normally think of time, and then kairos, and that doesn't mean time in a linear sense, it means moments. A better way to think about it is occasions. You know, you were born on a certain day at a certain time. That's chronos, that's when you were born. But your birthday isn't just a chronos, it's a kairos, it's a moment. It's an occasion. And if you have people that love you, which I hope you do, you want people to celebrate the occasion, to celebrate the moment. Not just recognize, hey, this is the day and time you were born. That's chronos. You're like, thank you for that factual information, I had forgotten that. No. You want people to celebrate the occasion. You know what? I am so glad you were born. I want to recognize this monumental moment, the day that you entered this planet, right? That's, that is capitalizing or maximizing the moment. Now, think about this. People who are drunk are looking to party, what are they always looking to do? Have a good time. And they're not just saying, I wanna have a good 9.32. Or I wanna have a good 11.75. Well, you know, 75, that's not possible. <laughs> you gotta clarify, I gotta... I'm on military time, all right? <laughs> it doesn't make any sense. But you see what I'm saying? They're not talking about Corona. What are they talking about? The occasion. T-G-I-F. Thank God it's Friday. Why do they thank God it's Friday? Because they ain't got to go to work the next day, typically. Right? So they're, they're looking to maximize the moment. Now, it's not wrong. I want you to hear me say this. It's not wrong to want to maximize the moment. It's not wrong to want to make the best use of the moment. In fact, it actually tells you to do that. It becomes wrong when you think you need alcohol to do it. Because that just leads to foolishness <laughs> and unwise decisions, right? But it's the same idea. And the lie that the devil tells us is being drunk will actually help you maximize the moment better than being filled. And I gotta be honest with you. I think if more Christians learned how to enjoy being filled, then we would actually have a better testimony to people who think they can only maximize by being drunk. Maybe sometimes people think they get drunk because they look at us and they're like, y'all are a bunch of stiffs. Y'all ain't maximizing no moment. You guys are boring. There's nothing about you that screams joy and excitement. And this is why I always think it's interesting. The comparison to being filled with the Spirit is drunkenness. That's the Bible. Which means we who are filled with the Spirit should be having just as good, if not better, of a time than those that are drunk. And this is the coolest part to me. Jesus, this word here, redeemed, is the exact same word that occurs in Galatians chapter three, and I think it's either four or five, when it says he redeemed us from the curse by becoming a curse. So Jesus redeemed us. 
Jesus purchased us. That's this word. And this is what I want you to see. Jesus redeemed you and me so that we could redeem the time. See, Jesus purchased us so that we might be filled with the spirit and we could actually make the most of our time. Let me give you the point. I'll try to unpack it for you. Jesus redeemed mankind so that we could redeem moments. Jesus redeemed mankind, all of humanity, in his sacrifice on the cross once for all. Salvation is now available to everyone. But here's what I want you to see. You and I won't redeem the moments unless we've been redeemed. You wanna know why? Because we won't know how to. We'll think that the best way to redeem a moment or maximize a moment is get drunk. Why would we think that? Because we're foolish. We ain't got no understanding. We think the best time is after we say, hold my beer. Right? And, and I want to push you. I've already told you drinking in and of itself is not a sin. But I want you to think about this. If you can't have a good time unless you drink, you're not making the best use of your time. If you can't relax unless you drink, you're not making the best use of your time. If you can't unwind, let me say like, if you can't be nice to people, unless you get a little bit of, well, oh, unless you, you know, kind of, let me say, I was gonna say, unless you get a little liquid courage, but that ain't about being nice, right? That's about like, you can't, if you don't have the guts to confront somebody, like Matthew 18, like we talked about last time, unless you get a little bit of liquid courage, you're foolish. You're not making the best use of the moment because you're looking to a liquid to give you something that only, and I didn't even mean to alliterate this, but I'm going to, that only the Lord can give you. You're looking to a liquid. Only the Lord can give you that, though. So I want you to think about this. Jesus redeemed you. He bought you back so that now by the power of his spirit, you'd be able to buy back moments. You would now have the purchasing power through the grace of the blood of Jesus, through the power of the person of the Holy Spirit to make the most of every moment. But I don't think a lot of us think about it that way. We don't think, we just see the commands, as I've said many times, and we don't understand. It's not just about don't do this, don't do this, do this, right? No. God is trying to maximize all of the moments in your life. And here's the best part. He's trying to enable you to redeem those moments. That's why Jesus redeemed you. Jesus purchased you so that you would now have the power to purchase the moments to bring you the most maximum joy. So Jesus can offer you that something that alcohol never can. It never can. And again, it's not just alcohol, it's anything else from a substance standpoint. So here's another point I wanna give you and then we'll keep going into the text. Here's how to make the most of every moment. How to make the most of every moment, ask yourself this question. Unless it is wise, it is a waste. That's not a question, I just realized that. It's a statement. But you can ask yourself the question, is it wise? Because if it's not wise, what is it? It's a waste. I mean, again, let's think about alcohol. You get drunk, you had fun, but someone had to tell you that because you can't even remember it the next day. What a waste. Or 
You got drunk, you had fun. But then you went and saw your friend Ralph on the toilet. Puked your guts out. That was a waste. And this is what I want you to see. This is why God gives you these commands. It's because he wants you to make the most of every moment. He wants you to maximize the moments. That's why he gave you grace. Jesus said, I have come to give you life and to give it to you more abundantly. I just don't think we believe him a lot of times. And so a better way to think about it is, you know what, is this wise? Because if it's not wise, that's a waste. Now let's keep going. Verse 19. Now, what you're gonna see here is you're gonna see five what's called participles that describe being filled with the Spirit. All right, that's why I told you being filled with the Spirit is kind of the linchpin to the whole part. So let me show them to you. Number one, or the first one, addressing one another. Addressing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs. Second one, singing. Third one, making melody to the Lord with your heart. Fourth one, giving thanks always and for everything to God the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. I'm gonna hold off on the fifth one because that'll be verse 21, but I wanna show you these four first. Remember I told you being under the influence of alcohol affects your speech and being under the influence of the Holy Spirit affects your speech? Well, now he tells you, here's the kind of speech. Here's the kind of speech. You need to address one another. Now, here's what's interesting. The word here, address, comes from the, I, I think it's just really cool. It comes from the more ancient word, adorn. And to adorn something means to make it beautiful. So a dress I want you to think, well, like if I'm addressing somebody, it's I am putting a dress on them, right? Like a dress means like, okay, I am putting this on you. It's like I'm clothing you. Also, what's interesting though, it says address one another. It, it can mean how you dress yourself or them, which I think is so important. Even going back to thinking about how we walk, one of the things that we need to be aware of is how do we address ourselves, right? How do we address ourselves? Do we address ourselves in psalms, in hymns, in spiritual songs? Are we singing over ourselves things that we would say to others? See, some of us, we are the meanest person to ourselves. We don't address ourselves like this. Like, you are a worthless piece of junk. You are ugly. You are horrible. You're right? Which is why I tell you all the time father of lies, you have to ask yourself would Jesus say this to me? Because if Jesus wouldn't say this to me, why should I say this to me? And some of you, in how you address yourself, need to hear God walk into the cool of your day, just like he did in, in Genesis chapter three, and say, who told you that? That was the father of lies. That was not the father of light. Because the father of light don't talk like that. How does the father of light talk? He talks like what we read in the Psalms. He talks like how what we sing in hymns, in spiritual songs. Can you imagine, we'll get this in the second part. Can you imagine if you came in here and our spiritual songs or our psalms or our hymns were about how much we hated God? I hate you, Lord. You are horrible. You'd be like, that's sacrilegious. But yet that's how you talk about yourself and others that were made in his image. You talk about his handiwork that way. You see what I'm saying? 
So being under the influence of the Spirit is going to change how you address yourself and change how you address others. Second, second and third one he said here, singing and making melody. Singing and making melody. I love it that he doesn't just say singing. He adds in making melody. You got to be able to sing good and stay on pitch, right? Which is why we have worship leaders and musicians that can do those two things. Some of y'all, you, you, you take that verse for real. Make a joyful noise. It's a noise, right? It's joyful to you. It ain't to us because it ain't on key, right? But think about it. It's not about that as much as it is when you are underneath the influence of the Spirit, you're going to be a person that wants to sing and make melody to the Lord. Again, and I want you to hear me. I'm not trying to chastise anybody. But when we gather together as the church, I'm not saying you should walk in fill with the Holy Spirit like you're drunk. Be like, I'm here to worship, right? But what happens when you get drunk? Again, for those of you who don't know, I'll explain. Your inhibitions are loose, like, right? You feel more free. Think about it. When we gather together as the people of God, you should be free to sing. It's okay to clap. It's okay to raise a hand. Now, the, Paul still gives instructions in 1 Corinthians about orderly worship. If you're running around hitting people, hey, that's, you're a little too drunk on the spirit. All right, let's dial it back a little. But, but there's a freedom, right? You want to sing. You want to make a melody to the Lord. Why? Because the spirit in you is calling out to the God that you're singing to. Next one, giving thanks. I love this. He doesn't just say give thanks or giving thanks. He says always and for everything. Giving thanks always and for everything. Now, again, most people think, you mean I'm supposed to thank God for traffic? I'm supposed to thank God for all this bad stuff? Don't think about it like that. Think about it like this. And I've said this many times. Again, we now know from brain science that if you are a grateful person, if you practice the discipline of gratitude, it actually changes your brain chemistry. You will actually be happier and less anxious and less depressed simply because you are practicing what the Bible says to give thanks. So think about it from that perspective. Think about it from the perspective of you're not, God's not saying, God, thank you for giving me an ulcer today. I really appreciate that. God, I'm so grateful. No. But what he's saying is, if you can give thanks always and for everything, you're going to be happier. So we always have reason to be grateful because we have a God. That's why he says, to God in the in the to God the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, which again, just a little side note, just a little pet peeve of mine. We don't pray to the Son or to the Spirit. We pray to the Father. That's how Jesus taught us in Matthew 6. But when he says we pray to the Father by the power of the Spirit in the name of Jesus. So when we pray, we address the Father, our Father. And we are praying, this is what the Bible says, praying in the spirit. We're praying because we have the spirit of the Father living in us. And so we're being filled with the spirit. We're saying words to the Father in the name of Jesus. And that's not just in the name of Jesus, amen, right? No, it's not just that at the end. It's saying, Father, we're coming to you through the sacrifice of Jesus. We know you hear us because of Jesus. So we're bringing these requests to you through Jesus, in the name of Jesus, right? So just a little pet peeve, all right? But think about it. You always have something to be thankful for in the name of Jesus. Now let's go to verse 21. Here's the fifth participle. And, and I wanted to kind of separate this out because this is the toughest one, and we'll get into this more next week when we start talking about husbands and wives, 
But look at verse 21. I want to point it out to you this week. Submitting to one another. This is lost a lot of times. It's submitting to one another. Submission is something that everybody does. Submitting to one another, watch this, out of reverence for Christ. So I told you there was five participles that describe what it means to be filled with the Spirit. So if you're filled with the Spirit, you're gonna address each other in you know, psalms, hymns. You're going to sing and make melody to the Lord, right? You're gonna worship God. You're gonna give thanks and the fifth thing that you're gonna do if you're filled with the Spirit is you're gonna to submit to one another out of reverence to Christ. Now, here's what I want you to think. The word submission, two parts. Sub is a prefix. And the prefix sub means under, underneath, to lower. Think about the word sub. Marine. A submarine is a boat that goes underwater, right? If something is subjective to something else, right? It's, or in my own subjective opinion, it's I'm bringing it underneath my mind. Or if I'm subject to an authority, I'm sub, right? I'm coming under. And this is why this is so important. In fact, let me give you the first point, and then I got one more. Submission is about bringing myself under the mission of Jesus. I I could have said bringing my mission under the mission of Jesus. Now, if you were here two weeks ago, the week after Easter, what we talked about in Ephesians 5, you know, people who commit sexual immorality or impurity or idolatry. And I told you then, if someone in their identity is in Christ, they are a Christian, watch this, then they are bringing everything under the authority of Jesus. They are submitting their sexuality to Jesus. Jesus is above They are below. This is why Jesus said in Matthew 28, all authority on heaven and on earth has been given to moi, to him, not you. So watch this. Submission is about bringing the mission of your life, the purpose of your life, your whole self under Jesus. Do you see that? And this is why I told you then, if someone reverses it and says no, Actually, my sexuality is over my submission to Jesus, then that's idolatry. Or my identity is I am this, then I follow Jesus. No. Because that means that area of your life you have not brought under Jesus. Now, here's the last point I want you to see. Submission is a result of being filled with the Spirit. Submission, bringing under, is a result of being filled with the Spirit. Here is the implication of that. The reason why people don't want to submit, it's because they're failing to be filled with the Spirit. Because here's what I know about human beings, of which I am one and so are you. No human being in and of themselves wants to submit. I don't like submitting. You don't like submitting. I don't want to bring my self underneath the mission of Jesus, which is why I need the help of the Spirit. I need the help of the Spirit. The Spirit has to work in my life to bring about submission. Now, again, before we get into the next section, the the rest of Ephesians 5, 
and the beginning part of Ephesians 6 is going to get into how submission works in the body of Christ. All right? So we're going to get into that over the next few weeks. But this doesn't apply to one gender. This doesn't apply just to children. This doesn't apply just to people. This applies to all of mankind. Everybody. Every single one of us have to allow the Spirit to help us submit to the authority of Jesus. So this is how I want to wrap it up, all right? There might be some of you here today that you have resisted following Jesus because if you follow Jesus, you know what that means. He now calls the shots. He gets to tell you and you obey And I just want you to be honest, okay? I know this church. I want you to be honest and just say, you know what? I don't want to follow Jesus because I don't want to submit. I want to drink what I want to drink, have sex with who I want. I want to do what I want. I hear you. So does every other human being. (laughs) So it takes an act of God. It takes a work of the Spirit to get you to submit. But if today, for the first time, you're like, man, I don't, I don't get it. I've never wanted to submit before, but something in me is telling me I need to submit. That's the work of the Spirit. And maybe some of you need, today need to trust Jesus. But again, I know there's a lot of us. You would say you're already a believer. And I'm not saying you're not, but maybe there's some areas of your life where you are refusing to bring them underneath the mission of Jesus. You're refusing to bring your sexuality. You're refusing to bring your money. You're refusing to bring your mission, your time, your talents. What if you're refusing? But I want you to hear me say this. The Spirit of God will always lead you to submit to the Word of God. The Spirit of God will never lead you to not submit to this. He will always say the same thing to you. Bring your life underneath the authority and lordship of Jesus. That's why he says submit to one another out of reverence. The word reverence means fear. So maybe for some of us today, it's not about being saved or trusting Jesus for the first time. It's about being reminded. You know what? I still have some areas in my life that I just haven't brought underneath the authority of Jesus yet. Let's pray. Father, thank you. Again, thank you for helping us, not only by sending us Jesus, but by giving us the scriptures, by sending the Spirit to open our eyes, to help us see And God, I pray for those that, again, maybe for the first time, they want to come underneath the influence of the Spirit and confess that Jesus is Lord. As you say in your word, no one can confess Jesus as Lord without the Spirit. So God, I pray right now for those who maybe need to trust you and submit to you for the first time. As always, again, nobody looking around or talking here as we close, but if there's never been a moment where you've trusted Jesus, where you've brought yourself underneath the authority of Jesus. You have submitted yourself to him. Then I'm telling you, you're missing out on moments. You're missing out because Jesus redeemed you. He paid for you in order for you to be able to redeem those moments. So this can be that moment, that occasion where you weren't just born, but you were born again. So if that's you and you want to trust Jesus, you can pray with me. You don't have to do it out loud. But it goes like this. Say, Father, thank you for loving me. That you sent your son Jesus in my place for my sin. He paid for me. And he rose again and he redeemed me. So I submit myself to him. I bring my life underneath his authority. And I pray you'd help me to maximize 
the moments. Thank you for loving me. Again, as always, if you're in one of our physical locations and you just prayed to trust Jesus, would you just simply lift your hand up so we can see that? We got men and women that are here gonna walk around. Thank you, put a gift in your hand. When they do, you can put it down. But then those of us who have trusted Jesus, again, submission is not just something we do or we did one day, it's something we do every day. We bring myself, our whole self, underneath the authority of Jesus. We're filled with the Spirit. And if we're filled with the Spirit, then we'll have understanding of what the Lord's will is, and then we'll know how to walk wisely. We won't be foolish. We won't be unwise. We won't waste the moments. So again, I don't know what area of your life that is, but if the Spirit is speaking to you and saying, man, I, I need you to bring this underneath the authority of Jesus. I need you to bring this area of your life. I need you to submit it. I promise you, he's only asking you to do that because it's only in your submission and being filled with the Spirit that you'll be able to maximize the moments of your life. You don't need to get drunk in order to enjoy life. You need to be filled with the Spirit. And the Spirit's gonna lead you to submit. So whatever that is for you, I just pray that you would be brave. You'd have enough courage through the power of the Spirit, through the influence of the Spirit to submit yourself. God, I thank you. I thank you for giving us this word. And I pray that you would fill us with your Spirit. Help us to submit ourselves to you. Because it's out of submission to you and one another that we'll be able to walk wisely and then maximize the moments. Redeem the moments that you redeemed us for. So we thank you. We ask all this by the power of the Spirit in the name of Jesus. Amen. Love you, church.